do list. Welcome to the Think Phase Podcast, where we explore the thrilling world of Master Duel, Duel Links, and the Yu Gi Oh! trading card game. I'm your dank dueling host, YT Dan, and I'm excited to bring you in depth discussions, expert strategies, and the latest news and updates for all things Yu Gi Oh! So draw your cards and connect your combo lines because the time has come to enter the Think Phase. Ah, yes, my boys, welcome to the Think Phase. This is a new podcast where we're going to have a lot of fun having deep discussions about various Yu-Gi-Oh! subjects and talk about things that aren't necessarily talked about within the Yu-Gi-Oh! community. I plan to have more folks on this podcast, so let me know in the comment section below the type of people you'd like to see interviewed in this podcast. But starting off today, I'm going to talk about a subject that I feel like we should discuss very deeply because I think it's a subject that a lot of duelists that are my age and older definitely go through, and that's returning to the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! Today, I want to talk about everything from, you know, why I stopped playing Yu-Gi-Oh! in the first place, what led me to being inspired to get back into the game, and just what is, you know, the purpose or general interest. Why would anyone decide to return to Yu-Gi-Oh! after playing for whatever, a long period of time. A lot of us started playing in our youth, start playing in our adolescent years, and it just carried over into our mainstay adult lives, and others has left and come back. So I wanna talk about that more in depth and just get more of that experience out there. And I wanna see a lot of you in the comment section below, or wherever you may be hearing this, or you can interact with this uh, podcast episode. I would love to hear from you What's going on with your return? You know, what happened? When did you return? What era was it? What master rule were you under? What things did you have to learn? But, you know, leave that down for me in the comment section below. And we're just going to go ahead and get started right here. So one of the reasons uh, or one of the things I wanted to talk about, you know, right off the back, why I stopped playing in the first place. So Yu-Gi-Oh! is one of those things that's been near and dear to my heart for a really long time. I've been playing ever since since day one inception of the game. So, you know, that being said, there had to be a breaking point for me. And honestly, I would say that would come, you know, some point within the synchro era, um, you know, not for any particular reason in terms of like I was disgusted with the game or, or a meta or anything. It just got to a point where, you know, I was getting to a critical point in my life where my professional career was starting to ramp up. So a lot of my free time was ramping down. So because of that, I lost a lot of time that I would invest in the Yu-Gi-Oh uh, hobby or the Yu-Gi-Oh trading card game. And, you know, at the time when I stopped playing, you know, where was I at, you know, in terms of a player, like, you know, was I competitive? Was I casual? You know, and I would say I was very competitive. You know, at the time, Gladiator Beast was still one of the top tier meta decks. And that was one of those decks that I loved and piloted from its inception all the way back in Gladiator's Assault. So, you know, given that, you know, I was still playing Gladiator Beast, I still had that deck. And, you know, I had won a few box tournaments, but I never won any like Konami official tournaments, but I won like a lot of trade center tournaments, you know, card store tournaments, you know, just prize tournaments for just, you know, random stuff or some cash or something like that, but never like official tournaments. I really wasn't big into the official scene, you know, honestly, until the tail end of my, I want to say, uh, competitive Yu-Gi-Oh career uh, because I really didn't have like a full grasp and understanding of kind of how that worked. And then also on top of that, you know, uh, transportation wasn't a hundred percent reliable as I was in those adolescent years. So, you know, sometimes you have a car, sometimes you do not, sometimes you have a bus, but <laughs> when my professional career started off, I really decided, you know, okay, well, I'm going to have to put this Yu-Gi-Oh stuff on the back burner. And I played a lot of YGO Pro to keep myself up to date. You know, I watched a lot of Team APS and things like that. Kept me interested into the game, but, you know, I never fully 100% stopped, but I stopped my competitive career or competitive run 
in the Yu-Gi-Oh world. So because I stopped, um, you know, there was definitely a lot of hiatus time. And then before you know it, I'm back into playing Yu-Gi-Oh uh, competitively because I joined the Duel Links community, which was pretty interesting because that this is a long time ago, you know, in this story. And when I joined playing the Duel Links community, um, I was one of like, you know, those first people around in a Duel Links community. So for me, um, playing Duel Links was just like playing like baby Yu-Gi-Oh, which was totally fine because I didn't have enough time to really get myself deep into the world of Yu-Gi-Oh. So I felt like Duel Links was like a happy medium. But then I ended up getting invested because Duel Links was something that I had a deep passion for because of my history with Yu-Gi-Oh. And then that translated into YouTube and all these things. So because I was starting to get deeply invested into Yu-Gi-Oh on Duel Links, I knew one day I wanted to return to the full trading card game so i started to dabble on games like this uh Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Duelists. There's even a few videos of that on this channel. And then, you know, other Yu-Gi-Oh! Sims, I just kind of started to play while I was playing Duel Links. And all in the background, I'm always thinking, like, there's going to be that time where I need to be ready for the TCG. And I had always just been dabbling. But by the time Master Duel came out, I had decided, okay, I'm really going to get committed and join back and get back into the game. You know, when I stopped playing um, Yu-Gi-Oh!, you know, I did kind of try to restart back up from time to time. And a lot of that was going back to locals, which I thought was definitely one of the things that it's like key to getting back into Yu-Gi-Oh is going back to locals eventually. You know, that's I feel like that's a pilgrimage you should make as a duelist. If you ever leave and when you come back, you should get back to a locals and experience that again. Cause it's it's a great experience. I really enjoy being at locals. It's it's it's, it's uh you know, I would say it's almost like in the right locals community, it, it, it feels almost like church. It feels great, it feels right, it feels real. So, you know. I think that getting back to locals is, is a key thing. And that is one of the points I do want to make for this getting back to locals. But regardless of that, you know, I did get back and play a few times. And all through those times I was doing that, I was always focused on my Gladiator Beast deck. You know, before they had a Link 2 monster, I was practicing with the Gladiator Beast deck. And when Lynx ev eventually came out, I was trying to learn the game again at that point. So, you know, one, one thing I would say too, like as a, if you're making a list of things, you know, first you're gonna have to kinda find a reason to get back into Yu-Gi-Oh. My reason on getting back into Yu-Gi-Oh is because I wanted to be a better duelist for my fans and audience. And I wanted to see if I still had the strength and power and cunning to be a duelist like I was back in the day when I was the, the type of person that could win like a whole tournament. So at that point, I really wanted to take some time to get back at Yu-Gi-Oh, get back at the game. And funny enough, around that same time, you know, my son was born a couple of years before Master Duel came out. And um, like him growing up definitely has taken a lot of time. And that's where a lot of time and energy of my YouTube actually went to was to my son, but now he's much older. So it made things a little bit easier on my time. Um, so now I can fully get back into the game, get back into locals. But here's the second point I want to make, you know, now that I have this time available and I want to get back into Yu-Gi-Oh and my focus was to relearn the game competitively from a modern Yu-Gi-Oh standpoint, fully understand like how this game has evolved and changed. I decided to return to Yu-Gi-Oh with the deck that I left uh, with and the deck that I left with was Gladiator Beast. So uh, this entire time, some of those cards from way back in the day have survived to current day. So I'm still playing with the cards that I loved and learned how to play with from way back in 2000. I think it was seven or eight. Just uh, I forget the Gladiator Beast actual date, but I think it's 2007, eight or nine, or maybe it's all through there. But um, I went all the way back and I still have those cards. And I still even have cards from my very first pack that I ever opened, you know, my very first collection. I still have a lot of those cards, you know, um, you know, they just survived throughout all this time. So it feels really good to have those cards in your hand, have those cards, you put them in your deck and you're still playing with them in the in the current day, it brings some emotional weight to it. And, you know, some people might tell you that that does not matter. But for me, that matters because I need to be passionate about 
what I'm doing and what I'm playing. So having that emotional tie to the Gladiator Beast deck did drive me to try to unlock the mysteries because basically this is a side note, a side comment to this whole subject. But I do believe that if you are looking to return to Yu-Gi-Oh, I feel like it's really important to use your last deck, whatever that deck was, and bring that back to see, you know, like like how effective it can be. Because honestly, what I needed to learn was how much had the game changed from when I left? How power crept is this deck now? You know, how fast is the game now? Glare Beast was a pretty fast deck, but it has the game fully outpaced Glare Beast. And I would say the game has gotten really fast, but the game hasn't fully outpaced the deck because clearly we were able to show that, you know, in a, a year ago with Gladiator Beast being able to top in rankings because it was so strong going second. And that was needed in the meta at the time. But, you know, it's pretty interesting just to see um, how much I have grown as a duelist because I objectively have grown as a duelist from the power level of the Gladiator Beast deck up to the point where I decided to move on from that deck. I can look at that and notice and feel that objective change and that's something that I know that I can measure because I'm experiencing going through that. I'm sure you can measure that in any way, shape, or form using any other deck. But me personally, I just enjoy having that timeline for myself. So getting back on track, you know, as I came back into the game with Gladiator Beast, you know, one of the things that I learned is because going second um the gladiator beats link monster would allow you to attack and to gain advantage i found that in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, there's always going to be um a starter monster there's always going to be um some sort of monster that is the bridge to the rest of the combo line and then a point of no return you know and i think that's what's interesting about Yu-Gi-Oh is if you can interact with any of those three points, you can definitely um, gain some advantage one way or another or get your opponent to stop playing the game altogether. That being said, I think it's pretty important and pretty interesting that, you know, to try to supplement your learning experience that you are having while you are playing back into your like locals and things like that. So one of the things that I did to supplement my learning experience was to just kind of look around for alternative um, sources of like Yu-Gi-Oh knowledge. And I know that might sound a little bit funny or odd, but you in fact listening to this podcast is actually another alternative source of learning Yu-Gi-Oh. You know, learning indirectly through my experience can help you build your strategies and build um, you know, a better understanding of the game. So that being said, one of the things that I found that was great for me was this book by Patrick Hoban. I, I don't know if you've ever seen or heard of this book, but this book right here, you know, Road of the Kings, it's like an excellent book. It explains combo lines, it explains blowout cards, and then it also explains the psycho, uh, psychology of the game. So it ex also explains, you know, in like, great detail you know all the um methods or strategies you could take to actually become a tournament winning champion so this isn't a sponsored thing at all i don't know patrick hoban at all i just like this book um you can definitely find it on the internet but you know road of the king is just a really really good book that explains a lot of stuff about Yu-Gi-Oh that i know and internalize from my experience but there is never a name for it for me, like, you know, like in my mind, I never had a name for a combo line. I just said, I'm, you know, playing my cards out, but, you know, playing the cards out and a combo line is essentially the same thing. If you are going from the same means to the same end, you like, you know, if you're playing your tri brigade combo from end to end, playing your cards out and you end on your Appaloosa, with your um, tri brigade revolt, then, you know, if you're, playing your combo line, you know, you're doing your one card combo and then you get Appaloosa and uh, Revolt. Yeah, pretty much same difference. So the book just helped to round things out for me. And then that helped to get 
me closer to understanding um, how I could retool my Gladiator Beast deck to affect the current metagame. And at that time, what was current in the metagame? It was Sword Soul, which was very, very strong, very, very strong. Um, and then also uh, Adventure stuff, which also was pretty strong. So, um, and then of course, Ash Blossom was running around. So then later on, you get your uh, Despia cards and things like that. So that was the era where I was playing my Gladiator Beast deck and I really learned how to play against and affect the meta. So what was interesting about that time um, was that when I played with the Gladiator Beast deck, I realized once I fully established my combo line, which was the going second summoning of the Link 2 with the Tri Brigade effect and then attacking and breaking the board and then setting my board and then passing basically with overwhelm overwhelming force, you know, a monster negate, um, another monster with multiple monster negates, control the attack, negate spells and traps. It was overwhelming to the opponent and it was just a really good uh, go second combo that could really devastate the opponent depending on what the opponent uh, was playing. But because opponents play things like prank kids and other things, it really made it difficult for that deck to win consistently going second. And then also you had Ash Blossom and the multitude of uh, monster effects, uh, hand traps like uh, Droll and Lockbird or Effect Veiler. So I realized that the hand traps outsped the deck and then also um, going second just to pass to the third turn was a pretty poor strategy because going second and winning on the second turn is what modern Yu-Gi-Oh was. And when I finally understood that very uh, definitively, it made me understand and realize I had pushed Gladiator Beast as far as I could go. Um, there wasn't much for me to do in terms of like advancing it more than I did. And at that point, I realized it was time for me to move on and I needed a more powerful deck to contend with the meta. So I started to tinker with other decks. And obviously at that point, what I could have did and what I probably would recommend other people to do from this point is to select a deck that's on a tier list, select a meta deck and learn one of those decks so that you can play through the game and have a better experience. I am a bit of a masochist, I suppose, because I like to play it on hard mode. I like to play Yu-Gi-Oh on hard mode. I remember watching a YouTube video and someone likened uh, their experience of playing Elden Ring to being easier to playing a match of Yu-Gi-Oh. They say going second and playing against a negate board is <laughs> harder than playing Elden Ring. Elden Ring. Elden Ring is a really hard game. I've been playing that game, but I've been enjoying myself, but that's neither here nor there. But Elden Ring is supposed to be like the hardest air quote game. And then <laughs> you got Yu-Gi-Oh out here apparently beating it in complexity. So um, <laughs> that being said, you know, I think that if you want to play Yu-Gi-Oh on regular mode, and not hard mode, you should probably pick a deck on a tier list. And then that way, from the point of relearning the game and learning the holes, even to the point of returning to the game, you might not even have a deck or want to play with the deck that you had previously. You might just be better off just grabbing a deck from your tier list. You know, there's tons of resources to provide that information, but I'm just saying, <laughs> don't you don't have to go hard mode but i like to play Yu-Gi-Oh on hard mode it make to me it feels more real it feels as if i am an actual <laughs> like super powered supernaturally powered duelist when i'm playing rogue stuff and my opponent doesn't comprehend the magic that i'm laying down upon them it's it's a different type of feeling then when I'm playing something and my opponent's like, oh, yeah, I play the same deck or, oh, yeah, my buddy plays this deck. So I know this in and out. It's like, you know, it's a different experience for me. And that's what I'm playing Yu-Gi-Oh for. I'm playing it for me. And that's one of the things I want to talk about now. Now that I've talked a little bit about just like starting over again and just recommendations from the point of 
inception of returning up until now, I want to talk about some goals. So like, what are your goals as you are returning to the game and learning? My number one goal was to make sure I fully knew and understood the current master rule or current modern form of Yu-Gi-Oh! so that I could bring that to my audience. And then another big goal that I had is that I wanted to win a local tournament. And another big goal that I had is I wanted to defeat a prominent player or two. Like I wanted to defeat somebody who I know was really, really good and understand that I have what it takes to do so. And I would say from this standpoint, I have obtained those things, but I'll tell you how I got to that level because now at this point in our story, as I've been telling you, um, I've been playing with Gladiator Beast and I've realized that I've gotten to a point where I need to expand. So I started to play Branded. And as I'm playing Branded, I like the Branded one card playing combo. And then I also like the different things you could do with Branded. And I liked playing Tri Brigade Branded because I felt like, you know, that was it wasn't a big reach for, for in terms of like a learning curve based off of what I already was playing. And also not a ton of monetary investment based off of what I was playing. You know, I didn't need to buy a whole new deck. I only need to buy a couple new cards. And after I played with Branded for a little while and Branded started to get really popular, the deck that I was playing was great. And it could set up three cards to pass to my opponent's turn that presented, you know, a couple of negates, you know, anywhere from like, I want to say three to eight negates, depending on how big that Abelusa is, you know what I mean? But regardless of that, I'm still losing to the meta, which is super poly meta. So there, so everybody's playing super poly now and I'm losing to super poly. So at that time, I just kind of was absolutely disgusted and really upset about that. I just did not like losing to Super Poly. I felt like that was such a a cheap card. It just stole my wins. Also, Mystic Mind was another card that just destroyed and devastated my spirits and made me really realize that, like, man, I need something that's stronger than, like, even this, like, at this point. Like, you know, I was like, now what's going to be stronger than this? Now, what's funny this is where I came back to one of those goals. You know, I wanted to be strong enough to beat some of the players consistently. And what really was strong in, in the local scene was Swarzo. Like everybody played that and then everybody played branded. So it was either that or branded. And then every now and again, you get adventure or something silly like that. It was always like one or two random decks. I was running around, maybe a, a black wing or something like that. But What I was really focused on was making sure I could bring a couple things. Number one, a new deck that nobody else in the entire room played because I was concerned about people knowing every single thing about my cards and I didn't have enough comprehension of every single deck that was previously top tier to know how to counter those you know i had a lot of current day knowledge but not past meta meta knowledge so i wanted to bring something that i saw no one else playing number two i wanted to be able to set up at least three monsters with a negation or some sort of uh preventing of the opponent doing things effects and then also it needed to um be flashy (laughs) you know honestly you know it can't just be formulaic by the numbers it's got to be flashy and i need that because for me and in playing Yu-Gi-Oh, a part of it is ego and i don't feel good about playing Yu-Gi-Oh unless i'm doing something that's absolutely amazing that makes my opponent surprised and gasp like if my opponent isn't like doing double takes at my board or double takes at my plays and are perplexed on how they can counter it. I feel like I'm not doing my job as a duelist. I need to provide that metagame shakeup because I need these uh, opponents to be sharp and on their toes. So I need to make sure that I'm cultivating strong duelists within my own community. Therefore, I need to become a better duelist and challenge them with out-the-box strategies. That's just 
how I think about Yu-Gi-Oh. That's how I've always played it, and I've always surrounded myself with that ideology and that mentality. But, you know, I don't expressly say it to anyone, but I'm saying it here on this podcast here. But um, at this point, you know, I made a realization, and this is something that is pretty interesting. I do believe, and this is, again, this goes into personal belief. You don't necessarily need to do this, but I do believe that sometimes you will be led to a deck like you will get to a deck that speaks to you like almost like when you're watching anime and the farmer plays a deck and all the monsters are vegetables it's kind of like that and i'll tell you like this so i have been going through a very long and uh frustrating corporate journey my boy it's, it's been disgusting to tell you the very least and because of this disgusting journey that i've been on i've seen that um I've really become uh, deeply entrenched into this corporate political world, and I really do resent it heavily. But I do realize and understand that sometimes it is a necessary evil to get things done. So in a, in a way, you're making a deal with the devil. Now, I think it's very interesting that when it comes to learning this game and the most complex deck to play. And one of the decks that people stay away from because it's so complex and hard to understand that it's easily to it's easy to misplay. And it's also, um, you know, as you're playing modern Yu-Gi-Oh, there's like tons of different interactions and metas and right times to play things and not, but this deck does, bring a very obscure audience and i'll tell you about this deck it's called the ddd deck the different dimension demons now in japan this deck is built off the corporate hierarchy of you know uh company men in japan of of of, of corporate japan so you're looking at the president the vice president the chairman things like that but in uh Western sense, they're legendary kings and um, lords and, and emperors and all these other things. So what I found about DDD is that the play style echoed my lifestyle and the combos was exactly what I was looking for. And as I looked through the um, repertoire of the DDD cards, I saw that they had a little bit of answer for absolutely everything and even for kaiju tribute. So if you wanted to play it, you could, but you just had to find a means to executing your combo correctly. And then also if you're playing against your opponent, learn a, 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 a great strategy to break their board or a great go second strategy that can help you, you know, get in and create your board and win the duel. So the reason why all that attracted me is because I had already been playing DDD and dual links and things like that. So again, I felt like I didn't have much of a learning curve and I knew the cards. So at that time I decided to invest heavily in the DDD deck and bought all the cards. I just went and just bought all the cards. And now I play DDD very heavily. I got to do a lot of practicing at home and I really like to do that like shadow dueling where you're just kind of creating combos and like you'll start with one card in hand and then play that one card out and extend that combo line as far as you can to fully understand how deep the combo line can go with the one single card. Um, and that was another thing that like is highlighted in Patrick Hoban's book. But, you know, I was already doing that, but never gave any thought to it. But, you know, that was something that I thought was pretty interesting that if, if you weren't doing it and you didn't know that that was a thing then you can definitely learn that from the book. And then of course you see people do that on like YouTube and things like that as they're creating demonstrations and things like that. But, um, as I learned the DDD deck and I learned the combo lines, I pretty much got into my head that I could set up the board the way I wanted to, and then also have a, change a mind control trap set at the end of that entire combo and perfect combo puts out all the negates plus a recursion monster and you can recur all these cards in your opponent's turn 
even if they're all destroyed. So it's pretty busted and their field spell prevents your opponent from special summoning um, more than one extra deck monster of the type of monsters that you have on the board. And the, um, the uh, DD deck has the ability to put up every extra deck type. So basically the ideal board is to set up, you know, uh, a board with the field spell you have your spell trap negate, you have your special summon negate, and then you have your floater, and then you also have Deus Makonex, and then he has at least like six to eight sucks. That's crazy. Like, you know, it's, that's a really beefy board that is really hard to play through unless you have a blowout spell card, Nibiru, or something like that to prevent all that stuff from getting set up. Um, but yeah, that's like that combo right there was the bread and butter combo that when I finally got to play against one of the people that win the tournaments every week and um, and I knew he was like the number one best considered duelist in the room, I played against him and I'll tell you very straight, it was a little frustrating for him because I didn't 100% know all my cards and that's another point that you need to kind of get before you, uh, well, not necessarily before you go into a tournament, but as you're going to tournaments, you need to try to remember all of your effects. And the DDD have a lot of effects, but some of the effects are negative, like take a thousand damage when something happens or something else like that. So you might remember that the card says special summon and draw or whatever, but then you forget about the thousand damage. And it's not because you were trying to cheat. It's like you forget and the opponent has to remind you that card does a thousand. You're like, oh yeah. So that's gonna frustrate your opponent as you're beating them down. That's gonna frustrate the hell out of them. And um, I think what was pretty interesting about that duel, and I still remember it to this day, that not only was I playing like the best that I had played ever at that one moment, I also side decked perfectly and that, to me expressed that I had learned significantly more about the game. And pretty much we were playing against Sore Soul versus Triple D. And I cited and, and I I cited in an additional token collector, but I played one token collector main deck. And when I played against them first turn, I had token collector on top of the ridiculous field that I just told you about. And then the second turn I had token collector and then some other hand traps and I learned to play around that. And then as I'm playing and going through my combo that took forever, we end up going to time and he lost <laughs> because I was doing the shenanigans. Now, what I learned from that is I should play a lot faster, but also um, what I learned from that is that I had the skill set to like, fully know and comprehend at least what I was playing against to, to, to play correctly. I didn't remember all the effects at the right time. And that was to my detriment uh, <laughs> and my opponent's annoyance. But, you know, definitely I feel like at that point, I really learned a lot and I started to play DDD more confidently and DDD became one of the better decks that I can play with in like full power Yu-Gi-Oh. Like I play that deck like all the time, but, um, yeah, I think that like that was one of the definitive moments for me, and and I, and it, and that's when I got back into the game and I realized I had accumulated my skill, and I felt like at this point now I'm fully back in the game, and now I can be a meta contender. And right at that time, time began to sink, and I kind of lost the ability to go to locals, and then all of a sudden I I wasn't uploading videos anymore, and then I just was playing casually from time to time, but not doing anything with it anywhere. And um, now fast forward to now. So at this point, I feel like I've learned modern Yu-Gi-Oh. I feel like I know, you know, what I can do to play against metas. And now that I'm current, I can just keep up with the meta and just evolve and just keep things moving. Um, I think what's really cool about playing Yu-Gi-Oh now versus back then is that the game has expanded in so many different ways and there's just so many different 
decks and archetypes and, and strategies and things to play. Um, and one of the cool things about Yu-Gi-Oh! is they don't cycle the cards out. They just have the band list. So because they don't cycle cards out, your old deck is still viable. That's why you should bring that old deck back. I think it's really cool to do that and uh, see what you can do with it. Um, you know, and especially if you were hyper competitive and playing recently and you had something like Dinosaur, yeah, take Dinosaur in there and devastate some of your opponents going second and get in there. But I really think that um, like Yu-Gi-Oh is a very, 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 very precious game. I think it's really cool that it still has the power to bring people together, even now, you know, 25 plus years later even now it is still bringing people together saving lives and, and changing lives for the better i know my life has been enriched by Yu Gi Oh. so you know i definitely hope that your life has been enriched by it as well and that's a wrap for this episode of the think phase podcast thank you so much for joining me as we explore the exciting world of Yu Gi Oh. if you like what you heard be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast content. Don't forget to leave a comment for this discussion and to share it with another duelist who loves Yu-Gi-Oh! Until next time, my boys, keep thinking, keep dueling, and as always, keep it dank.